Okay, so welcome uh, to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Katie Wilkinson and I'm the Wilder Communities Team Leader at Devon Wildlife Trust. And within the Wilder Communities Team, we have Petty Lewis, who's the Wilder Communities Officer who works across Devon. And she's here um, this afternoon working behind the scenes. Um, and also in the team is Emily Perriman, who is the Next Door Nature Officer with a focus in Exeter. So, the Wilder Communities team have organised this winter uh, webinar series focusing on topics to empower community action for nature. Uh, the topics have been put together based on conversations we've been having with communities across Devon. So we really hope these will be useful sessions and uh, we welcome any feedback or ideas for any future uh, topics. The next session will be on wildlife gardening on March 22nd in the evening. That'll be a seven o'clock till 8.30. Um, details you can find uh, on the website at devonwildlifetrust.org. So just a little bit about the Wilder Communities team. So we uh, are here to support community led action for wildlife. Uh, and we want to support and empower people like yourselves to take action for nature where you live, learn or work. Um, obviously for you, it'll be where you work um, because you know your, you know, your workplace, your school grounds the best. Um, so, you know, we, we're here to, to support you in, in what you want to achieve. So if you're thinking, um, if, it depending on where you are on your on your journey and um, it might be that you you know connect with us and we can come out and um, give you a bit of advice but hopefully um, Emily uh, will set you off on on your journey and give you some lots of really good information today um, the webinar series is one way the Wilder Communities team can support you but we also offer resources uh, online meetings and face-to-face -face meetings like I just said we could come and, and visit you uh, to discuss your ideas and see how we can support you. Um, and hopefully this year we'll be putting on some training as well. We aim to develop things in response to what um, you want. Um, so I'll be sharing contact details for the team at the end of the session. On top of this, we really want to share and celebrate what you're doing so that others can see the positive impact you're having and therefore inspire others and you know, other teachers and schools to follow suit and do something um, you know, in their school grounds, which will then share and celebrate and inspire more people and so on and so forth. So hopefully creating a bit of a, a snowball effect. Uh, the more people that are taking action for wildlife and nature, then the better for both people and wildlife. And we've got a goal at Devon Wildlife Trust to have a quarter of the population of Devon actively engaged and taking action where they live, work or learn. Um, and obviously this can only be achieved together and if we all work together. So it's really great to have you here today. Um, so this is our, whoops, this is our fourth event in our winter webinar series. And today we have Emily Bacon from our very own Wilder Learning team at Devon Wildlife Trust. She is the Wilder Learning Officer. Emily has been working with schools in and around Exeter for many years. She's a well-recognised face amongst the community and is really experienced in teaching the curriculum outdoors. She also works with pupils in schools who are wildlife champions to help them take action for nature at school, including how to rewild school grounds. We also just happen to have Paul Martin here as well, who also is part of the Wilder Learning team. Um, so before we crack on with Emily's presentation, we just have a couple of poll questions for you, uh, which Hetty will pop up in a second. So the first one is, are you currently taking any action to welcome wildlife into your local school grounds? I'll just give you a moment to answer that. Okay, one of you have been taking action with pupils. Anyone else? No, okay. So we have, oh, uh, and welcoming wildlife into our school grounds is embedded, so. Uh, into the school ethos and management. So that's really good. 
I'll just share those dots. Cool, okay. The second question, thank you for that. The second question is, what actions are you currently taking to welcome wildlife into your school? And these are multiple choice, so there might be several um, that you're doing. Okay, so planted trees, shrubs and flowers, installed wildlife homes like bird or bat boxes, recording and surveying wildlife as well. So all really good stuff. I'll just give you one more moment. Great, thank you. I'll just take that off. Great, thank you for that. So we're going. We'll have a poll question at the at the end. But now it's over to Emily. I'll just stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you. I will share my screen. There we go, can you see that? Yep. Ab, oh, we've got a few more people joining as well. That's brilliant, good timing. Okay, so, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how you improve your school grounds for wildlife, but also considering how you do that um, with children. So how you involve them in the process, but also how you um, develop the grounds with them in mind as well. So thinking about how they can use the grounds to explore that wildlife that you're welcoming in. So it's a bit of a balance because sometimes the two don't go together, but I'm gonna talk through ways where, where they definitely can go together. So first of all, I'm just gonna to talk to you about what we're, what the, what the talk's gonna be about. We've got a few things that we're gonna cover. Um, so I'm gonna help you think of um, ideas on how to improve your grounds for wildlife in terms of habitat. So you're thinking about all the different habitats you could create, um, like ponds, meadows, um, and the smaller kind of micro habitats as well. Um, I'll talk to you about what wildlife needs, um, and I'll consider small and large grounds because I know all, all school grounds are different, um, but there's definitely things you can do no matter the size, um, and then features for children and top tips. So why should we improve grounds for wildlife to start with? There are quite a few reasons um, why. And um, I guess you guys probably already know why that's why you're on this talk, but I'm just going to go through them anyway, just in case you need convincing or you need to convince anyone else um, in your school. So the, the first one, which is really important for us at the Wildlife Trust um, is that wildlife needs our help um, and by, you wilding, wilding your grounds, you're actively helping to connect habitats um, in your neighbourhood. So it's all about that connectivity approach. If you've got really good grounds for wildlife um, and then the local neighbours have grounds for wildlife and the park has grounds for wildlife, um, animals can move from um, each site safely. So overall, it would be a really good connecting thing to do. And there's such a thing called bee lines, which um, are, are so scientists have mapped where bees um, fly and, and where it's really good sources for them to get nectar. Um, and so some areas are even priorities for connecting up those bee lines. So that's a big reason for us, but there are many other reasons. I mean, um, doing it with a school, uh, you can get so many good tangible wins for wildlife um, and empower children basically that they can make a difference as well. So even if that's by planting bulbs, planting a tree, it's, it's real difference that anyone can make. No matter if you're in year one or year 11, anyone can do it. Um, and hopefully by doing so, you're also um, enabling children to grow up to um, be eco-warriors, as I like to call it. Um, basically creating children that when they grow up will look after wildlife and the environment around them as well. Um, and nurturing human beings, really. Um, of course, then it is connecting children to nature. Um, 
many of you might know about the disconnect that um, lots of children have with the natural surroundings. This is a really easy win by getting them involved in helping create wildlife friendly places at school. Um, you're helping them connect to nature as well. Um, obviously, there are loads of opportunities for curriculum learning in the process. Um, you know, the opportunities like um, getting students to measure out um, where to put a pond or mapping the grounds um, to just identifying what's there. I'm sure you guys know lots, lots of ideas already, but there's so many curriculum uh, learning opportunities that can come from this. And of course, once you've got everything in place, the, that curriculum learning can continue. You can do so many things outside um, the classroom. You can do your maths outside. You can do science. You can measure trees lots and lots of opportunities and I'll go through when I talk through um, later I'll give hints as well when for opportunities like that. Um, it's great for well-being so it's a well-known thing that being outside in nature is, is great for everybody's well-being um, including hopefully the teachers not just the children as well um, and also it makes your grounds look better hopefully um, especially in the summer when all the flowers and things are out so they're the main reasons anyway why improving your grounds for wildlife is a good thing. So first of all, what do uh, what does wildlife need? Um, so there's three basic things that wildlife needs. Uh, water. So if you've got a water source, you're going to bring in animals like um, your amphibians, so your frogs, your toads, but you're also getting a water source for your birds and other mammals and, and mammals and things that might come along and visit your grounds, as well as insects is a really good source for insects. So water is basic need for all living things. Um, creating shelter, so somewhere where they can rest um, by day and night, but also a breeding spot. Um, and thirdly, food, food sources. So they're the three th sort of things you might want to think about when you're thinking about um, making your grounds better for wildlife. Have you got one of those three things? Now, I'll go through each of those in the talk. Now, the hardest one for schools is a water source. Um, I know that's a bit of a controversy sometimes having ponds at school um, for safety reasons, but I'll, um, I'll go through that now. So ponds, obviously great for, great for wildlife. Um, as I've said, for amphibians especially, but insect life, many insects like dragonflies, their um, larval stage um, happens in the water and they're in that stage for two years before coming adults. And um, when they're adults, they're actually only flying for about two weeks. So it, they are really good sources for insects and other invertebrates. Um, uh, but with schools, as I say, it's a little bit tricky to sometimes have that space. Um, and you don't always need to have a big pond. It can be small ponds. I'll go through that in a minute as well. But this is a basis of what a, a nice wildlife pond looks like. So you've got the different layers. You've got a deep bit. You've got shallow bits. The shallow bits enable um, birds, like here if there's a little bird, bathing um, and also frog spawn. Hedgehogs can get in and out. There's a bit of a um, slanty bit there for them to get in and um, drink, drink the water. But if they fell in, they could get out. There's shrubs nearby uh, for quick cover for any birds that might get disturbed. And of course, there are some uh, pond, pond plants, different types of pond plants. So that is what a really good pond looks like. Oh, and at the bottom, there's places for things to hibernate and, and hide. So um, frogs in the winter will go to the bottom of the pond. Um, so that's really important as well. So they, they are all the different features of a pond. Now, if you've got a big pond and you've got all that, that is amazing. Um, but you can also have smaller ones as well. I'll show you in, oh, in a moment, I think. So uh, this I just wanted to show you here is that ponds are great resources, not just for the wildlife, um, but for children as well. It's an opportunity for them to explore what wildlife lives in the water. Um, this here is a, a dragonfly larvae that um, some children have found. Um, and it, it creates opportunities for them to learn um, and develop the pond themselves. This is actually a plan that we did with the school previously um, of a pond area. We actually mapped it with them about, we didn't have a pond before. We mapped um, and spoke to them about what ideas and things they thought would be good in that area. 
before actually creating the pond. Um, so that is an idea that you can do to include the children um, in the project if you were creating a pond. Um, this is quite a big pond. Ponds can be expensive. If you're doing a big pond, um, the liner can be quite expensive. If you want platforms, it can be expensive and fence, fence line. You need a fence line for safety um, so that children don't freely access it. Um, so you've got to take that into consideration. I'll go through fundraising ideas um, at the end, but take that into consideration. They can be expensive um, and yeah, something to keep an eye on. But as I say, you don't necessarily need a big pond. Um, this is a one that we actually did at another school. Um, it shows you, it's not, this is a medium sized pond. It's perfect si size pond, I think for, for a school, if you've got the space, you've got a deeper area there um, and shallow bits on the side. Um, and actually um, our team worked with a couple of willing teachers during a half term for this one. So you don't necessarily need a contractor to come out and do it. It just takes a bit of your own hard work. If you, if you have any free time, these things do take time. Um, but yes, mini ponds as well. So if you're thinking, uh, I've, I've already got a pond or I don't want a big pond because I've got the space or safety concerns, small ponds are just as good as well. They don't have, they about, we would recommend about 30 centimetres deep so that it doesn't freeze in the winter. Um, but they still provide homes for those amphibians and insects and just a drinking source for other creatures as well. So it's definitely still worthwhile. Um, probably still best finding a good location for that right next to the school playground, probably not the best idea, but in, a, in an area tucked away would be perfect. So ponds, great for wildlife, really good learning source for children as well. Ah, oh, this last picture of ponds. You might, this might be familiar to some people. Um, this is a pond whose liner is very ripped and old. The water is almost non-existent. This is quite a common sight in, in schools. Um, and we often get schools asking us, what do we do? Unfortunately, when it gets to this point, that is when your pond liner needs changing. And that's when um, you do have to consider the cost of buying a new liner um, and taking out Taking out all the, um, well, it's probably best to wait till the summer um, before when it's all dried up and then you can take any residual creatures of water out and put them on the side next to you in buckets and change your liner. Um, and this is one that we did, the team did um, a few years ago and that's what it looked like after it was changed. There's quite a big pond that one. So the ponds. Now, planting for pollinators. This is another habitat that you could create at school, uh, meadows. So meadows are amazing for pollinators like butterflies and bees, hoverflies, um, and you can create them as big or as small as you like. So they could be in small pots, they could be um, whole meadow, whatever size or um, area you have, wildflowers are great because they're quite showy as well in the um, summer months if it's successful. And just some top tips really here, if you don't know about planting wildflower meadows, um, we recommend a mix of annual and perennials. So the annuals will only come up once, but they're, they're your really colourful ones, like your poppies and things that you see in that picture. Um, so it looks, they look really nice. They're, really, they're still really good for pollinators. The only thing is they don't come up the next year, um, but that your perennials will do. So they'll, they'll keep on coming up. So having, having that mix there means that you're going to keep a sustainable meadow at school. So um, if, you, if you don't want a sustainable meadow, if for whatever reason you think, oh, I'm not going to be allowed to keep that as a meadow area, then obviously keep um, your, just your annuals. Um, does require a sunny spot, south facing ideal. Um, they really, in, and also prepping the land beforehand. So you want to get a nice muddy um, patch uh, so basically taking off that top turf is probably the easiest way of doing it. It's still a bit of graft, but get the children involved. Um, and it is a great one to get children involved because you can get them out um, measuring up the size of patch, the size patch that you want. You can get them working out how much seed they need for that size patch. It's quite a good like maths project. Um, and, and then obviously get them involved in the actual digging and, and sowing as well. Um, 
one thing to note that I've, I've had in a few schools, you want to talk to any contractors or groundsmen when you do this, because you don't want the really sad part if they accidentally go and mow over all your hard work. So definitely talk to those people beforehand. And in fact, um, we've created little signs of children before here saying, don't disturb our patch. Um, well, that's actually so that other children don't walk on it. So it's just good to put that as well there, just so it's left alone. But yeah, so also put a no, a no mow sign would be really handy. Um, and maintenance wise, wildflowers don't need a huge amount of maintenance. They should finish, they should flower sort of between June and September. And then at the end of um, the summer months, they should start to die back. It's good to leave them a little bit whilst they're dying back because they'll seed, self-seed. Um, and you want that seed to drop down onto the, um, onto the ground so that it keeps more seeds in the bank, basically. Um, and then you can either leave all that all, all the wildflower, dead wildflowers over the winter, which will create a bit of a habitat for hibernating insects like ladybirds. Um, or you can cut it back around October time after it's sort of dropped a few seeds and you can clear it up if, depending on what, what you would like. Both are good options. And basically you don't necessarily need to reseed it the next year, but it's probably, rec I recommend for the first few years, you might want to seed it again just to, it just to give it a bit of a boost but eventually it should get to a point where you don't need to see that anymore and it should just keep coming back that's if you want a, a permanent spot anyway so that's wildflower meadows um, and you can get creative with it this is a school that one of my colleagues went to and this was actually an old pond which they no longer wanted um or I, I think maybe health and safety concerns i'm not sure but they didn't want the old pond anymore um it, when we went by the time we got to the school they actually didn't have any water or anything in it anymore. So um, we came up with this idea of filling it up and um, putting rubble at the bottom to give it some um, drain drainage, filling it up and planting wildflower seeds. And it got really good success. That was, and the children got involved in that. So that was a great, a great project for them, great win. Um, of course, you, if you don't wanna buy seeds um, or you can't afford seeds or, or whatever, you can just allow some of your area, some of your school grounds just to grow naturally. So if you've got areas of grass, um, leaving areas for it to grow long. Um, again, that's talking to your contractors or groundsmen, uh, grounds people about not mowing, get the children to create signs saying no mow. This is a school where this just came up naturally um, and dandelions are one of the best, best sources for, for nectar for um for bees all year long really so it's so really you know don't get rid of your dandelions if you've got dandelions um and this is a little girl searching for insects it was quite successful there um and other ideas to do with flowers so um herb and sensory gardens this is one we did a few years ago um a herb garden herb spiral um and herb gardens are really really good for wildlife they're amazing so especially for your bees and butterflies really good nectar source but also they're quite low maintenance so um you can pretty much leave lavender bushes rosemary bushes to grow and you don't need to do much else to them um so that's quite handy for being at school this is quite a fun project because the kids got to make a little spiral and it, and it looked really cool after it was done and planted up um but they're really nice places for like sensory gardens as well. So um, quite peaceful places if you want somewhere where like a well-being place at your school where children get a little bench amongst the herbs and sit and um, relax um, and connect to nature. They're really good places for that. Um, and you don't have to, it's not just about smells. So a lot of these plants here are lavender things, really good for smells, but you can also mix up your plants ones that are good for, um, you know, touch, ones that may like long grasses that make noise in the wind. So it's like a full on sensory experience. So yeah, they're, they're really nice things to have at school. Um, and what if you don't have very many sunny spots at school? Well, you can try some bulbs or plug planting. Um, so best time of year for bulbs or sort of autumn time, um, plug plants, which are basically where the, the um, bulbs have already started to sprout, they're often called in the green. 
Um, and you just, they're just like little mini plants, basically, that you plant in the ground. It's quite handy if you've got one of these little, um, I can't remember they're called now, hand, like that hand tools, but basically they point in the ground. They're really easy to put the uh, plants in. Um, and the sort of things you want to look for, are, it's best to kind of go for native ones. Um, Bluebell, snowdrops, lesser celandine, really good for your pollinators. And the thing to look out for um, when you're buying bulbs and things is to look out for the sign saying if it's good for pollinators, um, because that's ideally what you want to do it. <laughs> what you want to do it for, obviously you can get bulbs that, that look pretty, but don't give for your pollinators, but that, that's up to you. Um, one thing to, whilst I'm on the topic of bulbs, um, there are a few plants to maybe consider that are poisonous um, when consumed or touched by, um, by anyone. Um, obviously, they're not often ones that you buy. They're things that come up naturally in the world. Um, so there's one called Lords and Ladies. That one, um, that plant, even if you touch it, you can come up in skin rashes and it also creates little berries. If you ate them, you'd get an upset stomach. Um, Schools ask us, what should we do? We've got these lords and ladies coming up. Well, it's up, up to you, but they're quite hard to get rid of, um, but they are also really good for wildlife. So if you can get a, reach a balance and, and sort of educate, if it's in an area where children aren't in all the time, if it's in an outdoor learning area where they're not in for playtime kind of thing, if it's just like a learning environment, you can teach them about, about them and how we don't eat things with berries and that. So it's a bit of a learning process. So make sure your teachers are also um, aware of the plants as well. But that generally, you really find that sort of plant um, if you've got like an old hedgerow an old, or an old forest um, woodland area at school. So it might not be relevant to a lot of you. Um, and if you don't have very much space, you might be thinking, well, my school's really urban, or I just don't have very much space. There are still loads of things you can do. This is one we did recently. Um, school planted up, made up these planters, planted up vegetables and um, strawberries. Um, you can just do plant plants, uh, pots full of your wildflowers. Um, this one's even got a little uh, bug hotel on the wall. Um, and here you can also get inventive um, and use things like tires. Um, I've seen, this is an old wheelbarrow actually over here. So you can get inventive, um, it's also, teaching the children about recycling if you've got um, fun things like tires um, and it's also cheaper as well if you, you can get a lot of freebies that way um, looking out and gum tree and things for uh, containers for your uh, flowers and um, whilst we're all also on the topic of planting just a few things to consider um, uh, while I trust we obviously like to say to avoid pesticides so pesticides you might think really handy for um, getting rid of those annoyances on, on your vegetable patches, but they actually end up um, damaging quite a few other insects as well, like your pollinators. So that we recommend more organic ways of trying to deal with um, do all those things, basically by hand, getting rid of s snails and slugs is the best way. And to be honest, get the children on it, you'll be done in no time. Um, and peat-free compost, uh, when, if, you go, if you're buying plants from the garden centre, try and look for peat-free um, compost, much better for the environment, or make your own compost. If you get a compost bin, um, some sites give compost bins away for free actually. If you get a compost um, bin going, it's quite a good handy thing to have at school. Um, yeah, but you do have to keep an eye on composting because sometimes at schools there's a lot more fruit pill than there are other things. So we want it to be a balance of fruit, fruit, veg, but also your kind of organic waste from like leaves and sticks and you can put paper in there as well. You want a bit more of a balance than just fruit pill. <laughs> so that's one thing to consider if you have compost at school. Um, and yeah, look for, good, look for plants that are good for pollinators. So they should have that hopefully that symbol saying they're good for pollinators. And actually we'll put um, some links through to some places, websites where you can, um, which, which we recommend for buying seeds and bulbs. Um, hopefully we'll put that through the chat in a little bit. Trees, so trees, um, again, amazing habitats for wildlife. Um, here we've created a hedgerow. So you, if you wanted a hedgerow, you can create hedgerows 
or if it's just a couple of trees that you wanted, um, either way, really good for wildlife. Hedgerows are quite are fantastic because they can help with that connectivity that I was talking about at the beginning of the session. So um, bringing wildlife from one from site A to site B, hedgerows kind of create that corridor. Um, this is a hedgerow that we did at school years ago that is now mature and uh, basically at the top of that fence line. Um, and it's really handy for a school like this. We've done it in a few schools like this now. And it's actually helped them because it's created a bit of a, um, you know, a site barrier um, because there's actually a footpath behind it. So that now there's like a nice sort of barrier between the school and the, and the public footpath. So it's also quite handy for the school. Um, again, it's a great activity for children to get involved with. Um, they're actually making like really tangible difference. You're planting a tree is what everyone thinks about when they want to make a difference to wildlife or for helping climate change. You know, planting a tree is is one of the things that they can really actually do. Um, and you know, if you've got a site like this, then you can every child can plant a tree at a school. <clears throat> um, Good thing to mention is actually here at Devon Wildlife Trust, we've got a project called the Treescapes Project, um, and they actually can give away free trees to schools. So if you are interested in getting some trees, um, app, sort of applications are closed this year now because it's end of tree planting season, but um, or nearly. But for next winter, if you're interested, we'll probably put drop something in the chat about um, how you can do that. We just email through. Um, and if you if that's if you're in Devon, basically, you can get some free trees, maybe not as many as what's in that picture, but we'll, we'll see. And someone will talk to you about that and um, advise you on how many you might need for your site, um, et cetera. And also how to maintain it, because maintaining it um, afterwards is not it's not hugely cumbersome, but um, they do need to be maintained once they're kind of mature. Um, don't we advise not to cut it back for the first few years whilst they're developing, but later on they might need a bit of cutting back. Um, and also removing of tree tubes. I see so many school sites that have still got tree tubes from 15 years ago when they planted. Um, it's best to remove them once they're quite a big trunk on them. So yes, that is trees. And it also, um, if you're really lucky to have the space for trees, orchards are another really good, uh, great source for wildlife um, the the uh, flowers before the apples come are really good for pollinators and also the when the fruit, fruit develops and falls it's really good for other wildlife like hedgehogs and then badgers they'll come along and eat it so they're really great for wildlife but also another amazing resource for learning um, children can learn where their food grows um, make apple juice whatever um, but yeah really great things to have obviously that is if you've got a very you know a bigger ground to do so if you haven't got a big enough ground you're thinking I really would like that um you can get smaller trees in pots um you you can what I would recommend is quite good to have um are things like blueberry bushes really good for pollinators and then when the blueberries develop great for birds um and you can keep them in pots and they're really easy to maintain. you don't even need to maintain them to be honest but they're a great thing to have um, quick wins. So log piles, really simple, quick win. This is one we did at a school the other day. Um, perfect for animals like hedgehogs, um, but also your um, amphibians like frogs, newts, um, and also potentially reptiles like slow worms. Just really simple, just gathering up your logs, your um, leaves. So if you've got leaf litter on the ground anyway and you want to tidy it up, you can put it all into one pile. You're creating microhabitats. So it's kind of perfect. Um, you know, year, year two, part of their curriculum learning is to learn about microhabitats. Why not actually get them involved in making one at school? Um, and as I say, yeah, quick, easy whim. Whilst on the topic of hedgehogs, um, something to consider is um, how hedgehogs might travel and get into your school. Um, some schools have this fencing, which you can see at the background here. They probably could just about get through there. We recommend a little bit of a, a biggest bigger space. It's 25 by 25, perfect to let a hedgehog through. Some schools only have walls. Obviously, if you've only got a wall, you're probably not going to have a hedgehog uh, come in. But you'd be surprised how many hedgehogs can go into urban schools. They, they have their, their range, um, their sort of territory range is quite big, so they won't just stay at school, they'll be living in neighbouring um, houses as well. 
Um, so that connectivity to be able to get into your grounds is quite important. But yeah, there's been a few urban schools in Exeter, at least, that I've been to where I've seen, I think, three or four that we've seen hedgehogs in. Um, some of them have been really urban sites. So yeah, hedgehogs are around. They are actually, uh, the numbers are really low, um, you know, globally, but well, nationally, but um, they are around and we can help them by creating these sort of good places. Um, then creature features. So these are really good projects that some of you might have already done at school. Um, expect you have, everyone, everyone's heard of bug hotels, expect um, really nice hands on DIY activity for children. Um, you can learn about recycling, get them to bring in old pipes, pipes, pots, pallets you can get off gum tree, um, or places like that. Literally you can get them for free and it's like, it's a really good, easy project um, and a wildlife win for your grounds. If you haven't got enough space for one of those big ones, you can make these little ones, which is in this corner, you know, just literally cutting up um, sticks, bundling them together, just simply is a great home for ladybirds to hibernate in over the win winter. So you can bundle up sticks like that and, and hang them in different places around school if you haven't got space for that that big hotel and it's also an opportunity for children to learn how to use tools as well if you if you've got secretaries that you trust them with um you know they can get chopping with those so yeah another good opportunity um and something i wanted to share is maybe some of you might not know what creatures live in them i mean most most of the things you'll find in them are your, your kind of general your mini beasts and spiders and um, wood lice but if you've got bamboo or elder which was in that picture here um, the the tube inside is actually perfect for certain species of bees so this here is a leaf cutter bee um, and they go into the tubes they lay their eggs in the tubes um, and then they go off find some leaves they literally cut the leaves the leaves um, with their mouths obviously um, and fly with them back and block up the hole so that the eggs are protected inside the tube. And then when the eggs are ready to hatch, they will hatch and come out and crawl out um, away and through those leaves. So that's a leaf cutter bee, but there's also one called a mason bee that does it with mud. So they go out and collect mud. So if you ever see, it's good to check if you've got bamboo, to every, if you ever see any kind of filled up holes, you know you've got those insects there. So yeah, it's, good, it's really good fun, you know, new things for the children to learn as well. Um, after, in the winter months, if you've had bamboo there for a while, it's good to swap it around. Um, bamboo can get mouldy after a few years. We wanna keep it like a nice clean habitat for those insects. So um, bamboo especially, especially will need replacing after a few years, but don't do it whilst they're still blocked up, you know, during the spring and summer months. Uh, another, Projects that you, some of you may have done or may already have things like um, your birds and bat boxes. Um, we normally recommend about three, put them up about three metres from the ground, so quite high. So it should be high enough away from the children, um, but also mainly away from cats um, that might try and sneak in and catch a bird as it exits the hole. So if you put up three metres, make sure it's not right next to a ledge of a wall where a cat might be able to jump up onto it. Um, and during the spring is when birds are breeding, so that's when they will start to use it. Um, they might not use it for the first year you put it up. In fact, it might take a couple of years because birds are very particular and sensitive to new objects. So, you know, have no fear if they don't use it for the first few years. Hopefully they will eventually start using it um, and we've had a lot of success for schools before um, with bird boxes. Something to consider when you make them, if you are looking at making them, obviously you can buy them as well, um, is the hole size. So different species of bird like different size holes, something you can find out online, what size hole. Um, one that I always find successful is doing the size hole for, for a blue tit that seems to always, they, they always seem to go for the bird boxes. So it's a good one to to go for. Um, bat box, this is actually a bat box that these guys are making. They're slightly different. They don't have a hole at the front. They've actually got a slit at the bottom because the bats will um, fly down at the bottom and then crawl up. 
Um, and with bat boxes, you cannot disturb them. They are protected species. So once it's up, it's up. Um, don't go looking in it any time of year because bats will bats are different from birds so they'll use it throughout the summer months normally when um as like a night roost so um just like a spend the odd night there um and then maybe move on to another site it's not for breeding it's literally for um sleeping so they're unlikely to be there in the winter but they can be so it's best just to leave if you've got a bat box leave it um, you might know that it's successful though if you look below the bat box if there's um if, if you can see sites of signs of droppings then you know you've been successful <laughs> um, but with, with bird boxes you do have to clean it out in the winter so spring they should start using it summer they might still be using it wait until um, late autumn or winter months to take down your bat box empty it out because they'll make a nest in your bat box um, and then you don't need to use um, any chemicals or anything you can just take it out give it a sweep and pop it back up um, ready for the next spring and hopefully you'll get more so yeah that is bird and bat boxes again easy wins you don't you don't necessarily need trees to put them up you can put them up on your buildings um, so you don't really need big rounds for those and of course when we're thinking about um, the grounds for wildlife you've also got to consider how you're going to balance it with your children on site as well um, we want the children to engage in their natural surroundings um, and there's ways that you can you can help enable that so um really good well if you've got places like woodlands not often everyone does but if you do have wood, wooded areas having like a swirly path going through it helps create that kind of awe and wonder. If you've got a meadow, if you've created like a wildflower meadow, you can put a path through it. There's simple and kind of inexpensive ways you can make paths. If you, um, you can sweet talk tree surgeons and get tree, uh, you know, um, bark chippings, or you can use old bricks to line out where the path is gonna go or old logs. Um, and yeah, you create the path. By creating a path in places like woodlands helps um, other areas of the woodlands, so like the nice patches of nice flowers and things. We wanna make sure that there's some undisturbed areas of the woodland so that wildlife can still thrive. So that if children have access to every single inch of the woodland floor, I've seen it in some schools where then there becomes no ground flora at all. It's just, it's just mud. So if we, if you create those paths, not only is it nice for the, you know, it's exciting for them, they get to follow a path, but you're also allowing some areas for the wildlife to actually stay and hide from the children um, and hopefully thrive. Um, but you can also make it exciting for the children by uh, making stepping stones in different areas. Um, you can use little wooden um, logs for that, or you can use, you know, wooden slices or, um, uh, like stepping stones, paving stones. Um, yes, yeah, so you can make it a bit more exciting. Different area, maybe one area is just like a normal path. The next bit's a stepping stone. Next bit, they have to balance on a log. Up to you. And you can create um, little trail markers as well. You know, things to spot. Look, look up at this tree, or look at the bug hotel. What what creatures can you see? And you can you can do things like that by hand. Um, you don't have to buy buy things for that. Um, yeah, and seating as well. Um, some of you might have seating at school, you know, just these log rounds. Again, you can see if there's a tree surgeon nearby that, you know, is getting rid of trees anyway. Um, it's quite a good way of getting those. You know, they're relative, other ways relatively, you know, inexpensive. You can obviously buy things, but um, that's a, quite a natural, natural looking um, way to have seating. Um, and having areas like this, um, so this little den, um, also it creates again it helps with that awe and wonder of the site but it kind of also contains the children <laughs> so they uh, they've got places they can go and hide that isn't in the bushes but it's you know it's exciting it's under the in in a den and they can look through the little um gaps and things to see what what creatures are around them so you know that's really another easy win um and shelter if you have shelter at school is it's not essential, but it is a really handy thing to have. Um, it, obviously, that is where your expense comes in. Um, but you, it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be expensive. This is a relatively small one. Um, so 
therefore cheaper, but you, you don't even need to get proper infrastructure. You could literally put up a good strong tarp. Um, if someone, you've got someone that can do some good knots, tie it up somewhere. Um, but as I say, you don't necessarily need shelter. It depends on how much how much time you spend outdoors. If you're going to be outside all year long, um, you know, just bring the children out in all weather gear, if not. But they're just some, some ideas really for outdoor learning and, and for children. Now, when you're thinking about you managing your grounds, grounds um, again, it depends on how big you want to go, what changes you want to do. But we find creating like a map of the um, place is a really good, uh, good idea. So you can put your ideas onto paper um, before you start. Um, and then you know what goals you've got to go um, get to as well. We do this process with the children. So um, when we work with schools, we actually... Um, get ideas from the children what do they want to see um, what habitats would they like um, and we normally collect all their ideas and we put it you know try and collate it all into one big plan and um, you know thinking about budget and things as well this is actually one plan that was actually quite simple it was hardly any expense really we tried to do everything quite organically um, at, at a school um, yeah so involving the children quite a good learning process then for them um, this is another plan. This is actually a plan for, because you might be thinking, well, I've got urban grounds. This was a plan for an urban school. Literally, you've just got tarmac. Um, and so we made plans for them to have uh, vegetable boxes and log piles, um, climbers as well. So like ivy's really quite handy, um, honeysuckle, really good things that climb up on fences and great for wildlife. It looks nice. It makes it makes quite a concrete brick area look wild um you don't need much space you can also have hanging pots so things like strawberries grow really well in hanging pots um so if you don't have much space you can still you can still do things um fundraising ideas you might be thinking i don't have very much money um and these are sort of some hints and tips for you really so you can look out for small community funding pots, places like um, Co-op or Tesco sometimes run their community funds, so you can put an application for that. Um, school fundraisers, so you can do bake sales, mufti days, and I don't know, or whatever you guys uh, normally do for your fundraisers. You know, if every child bought in a pound or so for whatever they're doing, you might raise enough for a pond line or whatever you need. Um, and look out for freebies. So lots of things that I've been saying, like, um, you know, like the car tires and um, pots and things, you know, a lot of stuff it, uh, you can get for free. Um, and also places like Morrison's last year had um, a deal going on. If you collected so many tokens, you could get some free gardening equipment. So yeah, keep always keep your eyes out for freebies. Um, Gumtree as well, good place for random things. Um, you can also just put in the school newsletter, you know, you never know what other parents have got if they're willing to donate things. Um, and great thing for the children, get them to write some persuasive letters, maybe to some gardening centres, you know, who knows, you might get some free seeds or something that way. Um, and it's, it's just a great task for the children, children to do anyway. So yeah, there's a, just some tips and ideas really. And as I say, the Treescapes project at Devon Wildlife Trust, you can get free trees. Woodland Trust as well um, do sometimes do um, packages of trees. So you have to think you have to get in quite early with that one and apply. But um, yeah, if you are interested in trees, we will pop over the uh, website for that. Top tips. If you are thinking about doing something fairly large at school, you again, you want to make sure you plan and budget for it. It's quite a good idea to identify those key areas that you might want to um, create just so it's not so overwhelming. So in, in one school that I'm working with at the moment, we last year, uh, we worked concentrated in one area and made it an area for the nursery children. And um, so there's lots of areas. You know, it was really good for wildlife. We had the wildlife flowers and, and the trail through the wildlife flowers. We also had an area of mud kitchen and things for them. This year we're, we're creating, we're concentrating on a totally different area we are looking at their pond area and how we can look after that now. So if you do like piece by piece, 
that it's not so overwhelming and time consuming for busy teachers, but also, um, yeah, it's much more manageable that way. Uh, get permission. So some schools don't own their land. It's, you have to make sure you do um, contact the landowner, especially some secondary schools that don't have, might not have permission for changing the land for like meadows and things. So it might be worthwhile checking, checking that. Or if you're on the edge of a national park, you might need permission to plant things. Um, get support from your senior leadership. Um, hopefully that won't be too much of a problem. Um, obviously talk to your grounds person, as I've said before, and contractors in case um, any mowing situations happen, or sometimes they might be able to even help you. If you say, oh, can you, if they, if they happen to be, um, you know, taking limbs off a tree, maybe you can say, oh, well, could I, could I keep that wood? You know, just having good communication with the team. Always consider health and safety, as I say, especially with ponds, um, with your plants as well, remember, some poisonous plants um, and also just generally tool use and things when you're doing projects like this with children. A uh, really good tip I recommend is creating a, if you've got like quite a good, quite a big ground, is creating a calendar for like your jobs year round. So um, when to when to cut your meadow, when to um, sow your seeds, when to um, plant your bulbs, have it all in a calendar and make sure you dish out those jobs if you don't want to or if you've got big grounds dish out the jobs maybe have one year group in charge of one area depends on it depends on if you trust other people but it might help if you divvy out the jobs or have it on yourself but get the children on it and embedded into their curriculum so if you know that you've got year twos out and uh, learning about habitats perfect get them on helping with whatever you've got to do in your wildlife garden and lastly ground force days so if you've got a, if you've got a big job if you need a pond clearing or if you need um a pond made made or tree planting you know why not invite parents over for a ground force day um it does take a little bit of your time if you're obviously doing it in um, out of hours but they can also, can also be really successful and quite nice for the community um for everyone to get involved and feel like they've got kind of ownership on, on that place where their children children go and you know obviously the children will be involved as well um lastly if um any of you guys aren't already involved with us um this is just a a quick plug really um on one of the programs that we offer wildlife champions project um so a lot of the things i've been talking about with my experiences with creating wildlife habitats um have been through the wildlife champions project and the wildlife champions project is literally um, a selection of children from school that are like a work as a wildlife council. Um, you might have something similar at school already, a green team, an eco team. Um, basically we work with them and we go into school for a couple of visits in the year and we help them pick a project. Um, it doesn't have to be on grounds, but often it is. So we might pick like a project on hedgehogs and that's how we then focus their grounds work that year. We'll, we'll make sure any, anything we do that year, they'll learn about hedgehogs and they can do something for hedgehogs. So it might be that that year we put on a wildflower meadow because the wildflower meadow helps insects. And by helping insects, you're then helping the predators like um, hedgehogs that eat those insects. So yeah, Wildlife Champions Project, we go in and help them come up with a project. Um, so they've kind of, they're empowered um, to, to make those make that difference to wildlife um, and then the idea is that they then take what they've learned and bring it out to the further into the community so they tell their parents they tell their friends you know they could do assemblies and things um yeah it's, it's a really lovely project we've run it for quite a few years now over 10 years in exeter and we've got various areas in devon where we're running the project now so if you are interested um obviously just drop us a, um, an email and we can get back to you and see what area you're in and if there's anything we can do for you really. We also do do just um, grounds advice. Um, it's a bit hard if you live right in the north of Devon. We try and, if you're more local, we're more likely to be able to come to you um, and visit your grounds. But if you are far, far from our team, we can still help you if you give us photos of your grounds um, we might be able to still help you that way and, and just advise you, um, you know, advise you for free, really, on what, what ideas you could do. Um, and that is pretty much everything. Um, so thank you for listening.
I have no idea what's gone in the chat. There's lots of things going on in the chat. But um, if I if I stop sharing, then um, I think we've probably got quite a bit of time for questions and things. So um, I shall stop sharing. Thank you, Emily. That was really great. And I think for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> You're bang on time, actually, <laughs> five o'clock. Um, but I think it definitely shows how you know creating space for wildlife in your school grounds can go hand in hand with people learning and increasing the opportunities for connection to nature whilst they're at school which is has been shown to to be really good for learning hasn't it so um so yeah really great thank you for that um just a, another point from me is we did have a webinar on fundraising and that's Ooh. on the youtube uh Devon Wildlife Trust YouTube channel so if you did want to go big as a teacher <laughs> and you want to apply for a big grant then um, there's some top tips um, in that webinar um, I think we're going to have a quick poll before we go to um, Q&A there is um, definitely one question in the chat and there will be others so the I need to just share my screen a moment mm -mm -mm. And then we'll get back to you, Emily. Um, so, come on, it's been a bit slow. There we go. So after Emily's presentation, we wondered, do you now feel more inspired, able or confident to take action for wildlife in your school? Please be honest, um, uh, especially if you don't, uh, because you know that would be really good to hear hear why, perhaps you may not feel that way. So I'll just give that a moment. Give that a few more seconds. Cool. Okay. So yeah, uh basically everyone feels a little or a lot more inspired able or confident to take action so thank you for that so that's good emily <laughs> um so now we'll go on to questions so is there any questions hetty there certainly are okay um so keep popping your questions into the chat if you've got any but the first question we have um for you emily is we have a school pond what actions can we take to keep it appealing and loan maintenance so it's not just green and mushy yes i actually had, i was meant to go through maintenance of ponds and i, I think i got sidetracked but that's a very good question so um Yes, ponds do need maintenance. They are probably the one thing at school that needs most maintenance, to be honest. So each year, if you're, well, first first of all, it depends on where your pond is situated. Um, if it's if it's got lots of trees nearby, um, an overhang, it's best to try and get rid of some of that overhang because that is gonna create a lot of leaf litter to go into your pond. And when that leaf litter starts to rot and things, it creates a lot of algae. Um, in your pond basically and it becomes not a very oxygenated pond basically not very good for wildlife eventually so it's best to keep on top of that so trimming back any overhang from your trees it might be that you need to get a professional in, in for that if they are big trees um but every year the autumn time is the best time to clear your pond so you want to try and clear any leaf litter um that is there um and algae as well can be a menace you can get rid of that with with your nets, but it can obviously keep coming back. There's something you can do is um, put barley straw on it, and that's meant to help um, prevent some of the algae coming back. Um, so that's basically what I recommend: keeping on it every year with that with that leaf litter. That's really what's going to make your with your um, pond all algae fied. Great, um, thanks, Emily. Another thing: also oxygenating plants, also great for keeping of that course, balance yeah. as well. Yes, so. yes. So making sure, yeah, of course, having those plants in your pond will help clear it as well. Fantastic. So next question. So I think when you were talking about the um, kind of calendar of activities, Emily, um, a question about whether we have a template calendar with appropriate tasks for um, sort of that time of year or for year round, um, sort um, of in general, maybe for ponds specifically. 
Well, I, we might do. Um, that person, is there maybe we could email the person? I have to go, I have to do some delving basically um, to create that, but oh, Paul's got his hands up, hand up. Does that mean he knows? Um, the RHS used to run uh, a project which you could look up, which mm -hmm. has planting for growing plants all year round, uh, which comes on a nice calendar. Um, but the thing I was going to suggest, um, if it's all right to advertise other wildlife trusts, um, the Avon Wildlife Trust, if you go onto their website, have, have created a 43 megabyte uh, how to how to develop your school grounds with loads and loads of detail. They um, do have a calendar in that actually as well. One in that. So um, I'd offer to send you a copy, but 43 megabytes on an email is massive. If you go onto their website, or if you just type in Avon Wildlife Trust School Grounds Pack, you'll have to register for them, but they'll see wherever you are isn't relevant because they'll want to contact you about doing some work. Um, but they will send you a pack that you can then download. So um, that's a really handy one to have just for every aspect of it. And I think Hampshire and Isle of Wight have also got a pack which talks about ponds quite a lot as well. So other wildlife trusts out there do produce these excellent packs which take a lot of work which is we haven't done one because we know that they exist out there that yeah. you can act or well, another thing on the on the ponds thing um not many schools have this but if you've got fish in the pond that can create algae as well fish aren't fish and well, fish and wildlife don't go hand in hand you might already know that but um that might be a reason why you've got algae as well <laughs> fantastic um so whilst we give um everyone a couple more minutes just to think of any more questions keep them coming i'm going to ask um a question which is a certainly a frequently asked question uh, that we've come across before from schools um so what's your advice around kind of maintenance of wild spaces or planters um and maybe who are the best people to kind of manage the grounds i don't know if you've got any advice around that emily yeah so that goes back to i think being organized with with like a calendar so setting up depending on what you've got at school, think of what, what tasks need to be done for those school and creating that calendar so you can be organised and know what to expect and when to do it. I think that will help. Obviously, the bigger grounds, the more things they're going to be. Um, in terms of who to talk to and who's best to do it, it really depends on your school situation. Um, some schools have um, grounds, people that are really um, hands-on uh, with the children that they can get involved and help with. Um, and also they know where the ins and outs of things and how long things have been where and, and whatnot. So it's always good to keep in touch with them, um, mostly. And then if it's anything that you think, oh, I need more skilled people with, like building benches or mud kitchens or putting in a path, you know, to seek out um, help from your school, school newsletter. See if there's any parents, there's probably skills amongst your parents um, that, that might be able to help. Can I offer that um, communication is the key. Um, often schools will have a grounds team that they just pay to mow. Um, yeah, I've already said so, that. You yeah, really. The contractors. The contractors are informed about that. Also, parents might need to be informed because sometimes if you're leaving a flower meadow, like you said, over to let the seeds fall, it might be looking a bit messy. But, you know, so having signs or newsletters or things like that can really help with the general feel of wildlife um, and also if you want to win over a head teacher sometimes um, the fact that you're reducing the amount of work that the contractors are doing can be a, a bonus because you haven't aren't paying them quite as much yeah it's cheaper often so that that can be a real bonus as well brilliant um, we just had a comment as well facebook marketplace is a great uh, place for stuff just got 40 tires for projects for free Amazing. and 30 are being delivered for free so that's fantastic to hear um so again we've got a few more minutes for questions if anyone's got anything um but on that point emily which you mentioned about um you know things just sort of being left over time do you have any advice for um how you keep momentum going and keep kind of teachers and people interested in taking action for wildlife Yes, that it really comes down to the a, re, a keen kind of enthusiastic teacher. I know it's really hard for teachers because I know you're all super busy, um, but you do need someone centrally that is that is going to keep up the momentum um, by keeping it 
you can keep it sustainable at school by trying to t train the other teachers or somebody else at school you know that could take over if you're going if you're going to be busier next year so it's trying it's just trying to keep it going really um and by having a network of children like you know if you've got a green team eco warriors or, or like our wildlife champion project if those children um are kind of given that um leadership skills to take on um any kind of project at school keep an eye you know tell the teacher tell them what things they have to do or keep an eye out um, and they can keep the ball rolling as well brilliant and katie was there anything you wanted to add about keeping momentum going or maybe even sort of involving your wi uh, wider community yeah i think just like emily said i think it's um you know if it's embedded in the school culture that you know, this is what the school does. This is what the pupils do. Then I think the perhaps you know the sustainability of it, um, yeah, will will carry on uh, rather than it being sort of one off things that that teachers do. It's having that yeah, having it embedded in in the culture of the school. And then certainly from the wilder communities team perspective, we are getting lots of community groups asking us how they can help their local school with um, uh, yeah, doing exactly what Emily's just said, basically improving the school grounds for, for wildlife. You know, there's loads and loads of keen community groups out there. So it might be worth, um, you know, rallying local troops essentially, you know, just seeing what community groups are active in your local area and just see if they uh, want to, to help out. Um, because we're finding that, lots of community groups really do want to get involved with their local school because they see the benefit uh, you know as Emily said you know teaching children to look after wildlife from a young age you know that will carry on into to adulthood um, you know they are the future generations and communities and community groups really do recognize that so so yeah do do bear in mind your your wider wider community um, and I guess the other thing is um, just thinking about it, local businesses are often really keen to help schools out. Um, so that might be another sort of funding stream. Maybe there's a bit of sponsorship to be had there. Um, so, you know, do do look outwards, do look outside of your school for, for help. And, you know, I think it's all about spreading, spreading the load, I think, will help, you know, helps it become more sustainable rather than all the work and pressure and organisation being on one person, you know, spreading it, spreading it out will help. Great. Uh, well, that looks to be all of our questions for now. Um, so if you do think of anything you know, a bit later on or, you know, after today, do feel free to email us um, on the email address on the screen. Um, so I will hand back to Katie. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add, Emily? Or no, I don't think so. I think I hope I hope we've covered much of it. I'll probably think of things later now. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it was yeah. I think it was really thorough and I think it showed actually there's some really simple things that you can do. There's some quick wins out there um that you know can be implemented very quickly at a very, very low or no cost at all. Um so thank you very much, Emily. I Thought that was great and I hope um, everyone has taken at least something away from it. We do have a feedback form uh, that Hetty is hopefully going to put in the chat now. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill it out because it does help us improve sessions um, down the line. Like I said, we have um, a wildlife gardening one um, coming up on March 22nd, although it does cover a fair amount, you know, it's very similar to um, to the, the topics um, that, that Emily's talked about, uh, but perhaps yourself or friends or family or other colleagues might be interested. So do go to our website, devilmildlifetrust.org to sign up to that. If you've got any queries um, or questions, then you can get in touch with the Wilder Communities team at wildercommunities at devilmildlifetrust.org uh, or the Wilder Learning team. I believe it's Wilder Learning at devilmildlifetrust.org, yes. Emily. Yep. Yeah. So any anything to do with wildlife champions or school grounds, um, then please get in touch with that team. But anyway, we'll let you get on. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Emily and Paul. And um, yeah, see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone.